Welcome back. Last month I tweeted, holy shit, Bing Lu's film Minding the Gap wrecked me. Skateboarding, friendship, cycles of abuse, masculinity, one of the best documentaries I've seen in a minute. The movie had me in tears multiple times, and that was before the closing credits ran as the Mountain Goats played. Bing Lu, the director of the Oscar-nominated documentary Minding the Gap, joins me now. Good morning. How are you, man? I'm great. I just flew in from L.A. in a red eye, so <laughs> I'm as good as I can be, I guess. Yeah. You're like, I'm literally still waking up a yeah, little bit? A little bit. Yeah. I understand that. Yeah. What? Speaking of moments, I'm going to woken you up a little bit. What was it like to find out that you were nominated for an Oscar? I had the flu for a couple of days before, so I, like, I hadn't slept at all, you know, so I, like, I, it, I think I was... I was binge watching Brooklyn Nine Nine like throughout the night, mm -hmm. and then I was like, "Oh, time to stream the announcements." And then it got announced, and I was like, "You know, I just like let it, I let it sink in." I think I just wanted to make sure, you know, maybe it wasn't a mistake. You know? <laughs> um, and then I had to like take some Tylenol and go on a shoot. <laughs> and you had to go go yeah. do some work. Yeah. Were you expecting it? Were, did, did you have? Like, like, had anybody whispered anything to you? Like, it could be a contender, or...? It was, I mean, it was in all the trades and the buzz, and, you know, yeah. it was in all the things, but I'd also heard that the doc branch traditionally is just really unpredictable. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I'm just the type of guy who just sort of, you know, like, doesn't have a lot of expectations, so I was just prepared for, you know, whatever outcome. All right. Well, let's talk about the film itself, man. Uh, listen, when, when did you know that you were making a documentary that was about more than just skateboarding? Um, I mean, it was sort of built in into the beginning, uh, and that's to say, I really didn't start the film until five years ago, um, and for a long time it just felt like this present-day story. Um, it started with me going around the country and interviewing skateboarders from all over and just trying to get a sense of what it was like growing up and, you know, trying to deal with the things that I guess I went through as a child, but, you know, by proxy through other people. And then um, a year in, I went back to Rockford, Illinois, where I grew up, and I ran into this guy, Kier, and I immediately fell in love with him. Um, shortly after, I ran into this, this other guy, Zach, who I knew a little bit growing up, and he was about to become a father, and he was even self-aware about this, but he just wasn't quite ready for fatherhood. And, mm -hmm. you know, we just went on that journey. That was around the time when I um, started partnering up with Cartemquin Films in Chicago, who's best known for Hoop Dreams. Okay. Um, that's when I realized, like, oh, you know, documentaries can be sort of like fiction films. Yeah. It wasn't until the final months of editing that I dug into archival, you know, constructed this, like, you know, 12-year span of, of a story. Mm -hmm. And you did. You had those archives. Do you remember when you f first picked up a camera and, like, why you started shooting your friend skateboarding? Um, I, it, was, it was actually because I saw a couple other kids who were making skate videos, and I just really appreciated, you know, how much they cared about it in a way that other people cared about skateboarding. You know, they were really, really just spent a lot of time editing and shooting and looking at other skate videos and you know it was, it was a genre and so i wanted to do that too so um yeah you talk about your friendship with zach and kier uh, f at first what did it mean to focus on them and kind of let the other parts of the project kind of slide away it was sort of out of expediency i mean i was working as a camera assistant in chicago and um yeah i just couldn't afford to go to portland or new york or st louis all the time to keep following these other people um, so I just did the 90-minute, two-hour drive to Rockford every time I got a free chance to, to follow these boys. Um, but, it, I mean, it still took a while for me to let go of, like, this one guy in Portland. I just kept flying back to follow him. Uh, eventually, though, just the things that happened in Zach and Kier's lives were, like, you couldn't script them. It was just so unbelievable. And you know, they were the ones that ended up just, um, you know, like re re being, being maintained in all the rough cuts that I was making. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, really a third subject emerges, which is yourself. Uh, how, how did you kind of, were you able to distance yourself from the story to make this larger arc? Um, and, and when did you realize that you were going to become a part of the documentary? Uh, that decision came late. Uh, so the scene ends with one of the boys moving out of the city. And it's like, it was his goal from the beginning, and he finally does it. Uh, it wasn't until a year after that that I did this interview with my mom, which is the anchor scene for my, for my storyline. Mm -hmm. uh, and it wasn't, like, I went into those, so it was, it was sort of like, a, like an aesthetic problem at first. I was like, I don't want to do voiceover cards on the screen or, you know, like, sit myself in front of a camera and talk into it. Um, maybe it's more, maybe it's just be more organic if I interviewed my mom, my brother, and a former mentor of mine from, from Rockford. 
And when I went into those interviews, I thought of it as exposition. Like, I'm going to get these people to give backstory to, you know, for, for my character, the filmmaker. And what I didn't expect was for, uh, for how difficult those conversations sort of became. Mm -hmm. um, you know, part of the scene with my mom is that I, I kind of challenged her a little bit about, you know, what had happened. And I didn't realize that I was going to do that. Um, and I think I, I walked out of that conversation realizing that although I'd sort of denied myself in my 20s, you know, the, the feelings of, of um, bitterness or, or blame towards her, that 8-year-old, that 9-year-old, that 10-year-old version of myself did have those feelings. And that came out in that interview. I mean, it's incredible to hear that you, 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 you made that decision in that moment because I think it translates so strongly onto the film in that moment. Like, like it's clear that that was an organic moment. Uh, and, it, so, and that's uh, the whole film is made up of so many of those moments. Again, I know we're, we're trying to stay away from spoilers because I want so many people to have the experience that I had as you slowly learn that this is a story not just about skateboarding. But what did it mean to you? What do you hope a viewer takes away from your film about abuse? I mean, I think my my main thing, and this is like none of this is explicit. It's very, you know, just um, I'm hoping people get this from the narrative, but I, I just don't think it helps to demonize um, perpetrators of violence. It doesn't mean we don't hold them accountable for the actions that they do, and you know, create a set of consequences. But um, I think we have to start looking at the causes of violence and not just the symptoms. Mm -hmm. And I think that's sort of what this film is about. You know, it's about all the complexities of how that cycle just keeps turning. Mm -hmm. And how abuse is kind of handed down from person to person. Right. I was so part of like why I started this project too is as I was entering my 20s, I just, you know, I thought I was trying to become a better person, right? And like I, I avoided in my adolescence, I just tried avoiding anything that reminded me of my stepfather and I didn't want to take on those traits. Mm -hmm. But I, I kind of became scared that I was just going to happen. It was just going to happen anyway, like accidentally, um, because that's what I was witnessing around me. You know, I think I was witnessing my peers just like start accidentally becoming their fathers. Mm -hmm. And it was it was scary. Mm -hmm. it was, yeah, I mean, it's something, <laughs> something I deeply relate to. Yeah. And that's why your film connected uh, with me so much. One last question here, because you are you're headed to the Oscars, man. Do you have, like, is there anyone you want to shoot your shot with, get a <laughs> selfie with? Like, is there anyone you're just so excited to meet? I saw you You got to uh, to meet Tony Hawk. I got, so yeah, the past year has been crazy. I got to meet Tony Hawk. You know, Barry Jenkins has been a big supporter. Uh-huh. Uh, I can't, yeah, I mean, Stephen Yoon. Um, I've gotten a lot, I've gotten, like, I've, I met Obama last year. What? Like, you know, like, spoke at his summit, and he posted about, you know, our film being his, you know, his top 10 films of 2018. I mean, it's, it was been a crazy year. I feel like I'm already super satisfied. If I can get another selfie with like, I don't know, Lady Gaga or something, maybe. Like, Lady Gaga's yeah, the, I, no, no, the, no, no, I like no, that, man. I, You're I, setting the I'm, bar I'm, high. I have no, <laughs> I like that. I'll just take what I can get. You no, know? man. I'm just like the doc, I'm just the Midwest bumpkin. Like, no, I want you to maker, dream like, big on this yeah. one. I want you to know, I want you to come back to this moment. If you see Lady Gaga, I say go for it, man. But seriously, thank you for creating such a beautiful piece of art. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much. Listen, uh, if you have not watched Minding the Gap yet, you have to. It is streaming on Hulu. No excuses. Go watch it. More AM to DM is up next. <laughs>